Thank you all for being here tonight. Again, I apologize for the condition of my throat. I trust the Lord will give me the strength to get through this and will give you the strength to get through this. I would imagine if you were here this morning, you may have left thinking, well, boy, you've left us in a fine fix, Dr. Bonson. Here you laid all this information on us that indicates that the Bible expects us to defend the faith. That that's not just the job of pastors and elders, not just the job of somehow the minor number of scholars we may have in the Christian community, but it's the job of every Christian to be prepared to answer anything, any objection that is raised by any man about the Christian hope. Now we have to figure out how to do that, and that's our task tonight, to talk about how we end up answering the objections that are brought to us. The title of this night's message is Answering Fools Without Becoming One. Toward that end, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew, the seventh chapter, to a very familiar text of God's Word, a story that's known to every Sunday school child, Matthew chapter 7, where I'll begin reading at the 24th verse. Matthew 7, 24, hear God's Word. Everyone, therefore, that hears these words of mine and does them shall be likened unto a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew, and beat upon that house, but it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. But everyone that hears these words of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a fool who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, And the winds blew and smote upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall thereof. As far as the reading of God's word. Jesus here in the Sermon on the Mount, as he brings his well-known sermon to a climax, to an end, contrasts two kinds of men, wise men and fools. And as I indicated, every Sunday school child knows what this story is all about. We sing songs about it. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and Jesus tells us that the rock is his word. Those who build their lives, those who um, have a perspective on life that is founded on his teaching, those who are his disciples and therefore lead their lives on the basis of what he has taught, are wise people. But now how does Jesus style those who do not accept what he teaches? How does he refer to those that um, will not obey the teaching of his word. I wonder if you see things the way Jesus does here. And the reason I wonder is because I suspect you don't. Now, I know that none of you come in tonight willfully wanting to disagree with the word of God, but there is nevertheless a way in which we live, our habits, our normal responses to situations in life that many times are unfaithful. What I have found in the Christian community, particularly in the area of how we defend the faith, is a great regard for those who are in scholarly positions and who attack the faith. We tend to look up to them and say, boy, they sure know a lot. We don't happen to agree with them. Sometimes we're not sure how we would answer them, but boy, these are learned men. And they are esteemed in our culture, given the spirit of our times, as very wise people. Yeah, I don't imagine that there are a lot of university professors who have students who are, you know, cowering at their feet and so forth or revering, you know, their their every word and trying to write it down to make sure it's published and kept for all eternity. It may not be that extreme. But nevertheless, we look up to worldly education. We look up to worldly learning in our day and age. And Christians, God's people, tend to do that. And that's one of the reasons why when scholars who are unbelievers make some kind of a pronouncement or write an article, publish a book that attacks the Christian faith, many Christians say, well, I'm glad that there's somebody around who deals with that sort of thing. I don't know what I would do. And actually, we stand in some kind of awe, maybe a little bit of trembling about the scholarship of the world. But Jesus tells us that we should look upon those who do not accept his word and do not obey it not as people who are very intelligent, but just haven't drawn the right conclusion about the character of Jesus. Jesus says they are not intelligent people. Now, we're really going to have to rattle our conceptual apparatus here. 
to bring things in line with the way Jesus sees things. Because we look upon technical competence in history, let's say, or in literature or philosophy, whatever it may be. We look upon technical competence as the same thing as intelligence or wisdom. But Jesus didn't. In fact, the entire Bible does not. Let's go into the Old Testament for just one of many illustrations of that. If you want a lengthy illustration of the point I'm making as we open tonight, you should study the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs has as its extended theme a contrast between wisdom and foolishness. And the fool is not, well, in the first place, I should make clear that when the Bible calls people fools, it's not engaging in the sort of name-calling that, that Mr. T got a reputation for. You know, remember the A-team? Those were the good old days of TV, right? Mr. T would show up, and often, because he was upset with somebody, he'd say, you fool. That was name-calling. But when the Bible refers to people as fools, it's not engaging in name-calling. In fact, the Lord tells us we are not to call people fools with that spirit in mind. Or we're just trying to say, you know, you knucklehead, you airhead, whatever it may be, and make fun of them. And yet the Bible repeatedly refers to people in a descriptive, not an emotive, name-calling way as fools. The book of Proverbs does that at great length. But for our purposes tonight, let me just illustrate this from the 14th Psalm. Psalm 14. And I'll read just the first four verses for you this evening. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. Jehovah looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek after God. They are all gone aside. They are together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not even one. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon Jehovah. Now, in these opening verses of Psalm 14, notice how the psalmist looks upon the atheist of his day. How do we look upon atheists in our day? We have a number who have published books against religion in general, against Christianity in particular. They have positions as professors of philosophy and so forth in our secular universities. How do we look upon them? Well, again, we tend to look upon them as scholars, as people who have difficult, you know, questions and, and objections and challenges that need to be answered. But the psalmist says, it's the fool who says in his heart, there is no God. Now, what is it that leads people to say there is no God? According to the Bible, is it all of the difficulties academically, philosophically? Is it all the intellectual problems that might be raised that lead people to atheism? Psalm 14 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God, and immediately we are told they are corrupt and have done abominable works. There's none that doeth good. People do not reject the existence of God because of academic problems with theism. They reject the existence of God because of the condition of their own hearts. They are guilty before God, corrupt, having done abominable works. None of them does good. Indeed, Jehovah looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if any did understand, if any did seek after God, and what God tells us, this is anthropomorphism, obviously God didn't need to do some kind of survey to find this out, but in terms of the poetry of this psalm, the results are given, they are all gone aside, they are together become filthy, there's none that does good, not even one. And then the psalmist says, all the workers of iniquity have no understanding. It isn't because they're so smart. It isn't because they're so wise. It isn't because of academic and intellectual problems that people become atheists. Become atheists, according to the Bible, they engage in that line of thinking because of a lifestyle that is displeasing to God. It's far more comfortable, you see, to say that there is no God and to reassure your heart that there is no God because then you won't have to answer to God for the character of your life. Now in philosophy, in debate, this is sometimes called ad hominem, against the man, criticism. But the Bible engages in that kind of ad hominem preaching and exhortation. The Bible says you need to look at your motives 
for what you're thinking. And the motives of the atheist are not pure. The atheist has a motivation to escape God because the presence of God is uncomfortable. The well-known existential philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre openly admitted the very thing Psalm 14 teaches us. You need to be aware of that. Many times, unbelievers are quite transparent about what they are doing. In his autobiography entitled Words, the Words, Sartre speaks about how he had this idea that as a writer he had a prophetic mantle upon his shoulders. But he could not bear the idea of a God who was looking at him at all times. I mean, he openly says that. He says, I could not stand the notion that there was a divine presence that watched me repeatedly. And so he gave up theism, and the day came where he had to realize that as a writer, he had no special quasi-divine calling in this world. And so he says, quote-unquote, one day in the basement, I collared the Holy Spirit and threw him out the window which is dramatic language for saying he would have nothing to do with the idea that there's a God or any purpose in life that goes beyond the existential moment. Now, why did he do that? Was it because he had examined all the evidence and rational integrity required it of him? He tells us why he threw God out. He said he couldn't stand the idea of a God who knew what he was doing all the time. And so, as the psalmist tells us, the quality of atheistic thinking is foolish. You are wrong, and that's why you are intimidated. You are wrong to look upon the unbeliever as somehow having academic reasons that are difficult for you to deal with. Now, of course, they're going to continue to throw their intellectual problems out there, and you have to be able to deal with them. But you must know, as a child of God, that the person with whom you are dealing is a fool, you must not be intimidated. You must not respect this line of thinking. Jesus teaches us in the seventh chapter of Matthew the same thing. But he says, those who will not receive my word are not intelligent people who think they've, you know, got a little bit, you know, they've got one step up on me here. They're wrong about that. But, you know, they're intelligent people and, and their arguments are pretty respectable as far as they go. He says, people who won't receive what I'm teaching are fools. So foolish and so obviously foolish that he likens them to people who try to build a house upon the seashore, upon the sand. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Maybe here in South Carolina you don't do a lot of that because you don't enjoy what we do out in paradise in Southern California, having these wonderful beaches that we can go to. Yeah, yeah, I know. Let me beat you to the punch and say, but at least we aren't shaking and baking here in South Carolina. No, Okay. When I went to Moscow, um, a number of the engagements that I had, a number of my speaking engagements were at conferences that all sorts of religions or all sorts of worldviews together to have people address things. And I was sometimes the token Christian, at least that's the way I felt. I went to one conference where there were a number of people claiming to be Christians, but it was all religious traditions in Russia. It was an international conference on religious liberty. And so they had the Russian Orthodox Church represented there and the Roman Catholic Church represented there and there were Lutherans and Seventh-day Adventists and all sorts of things. And in addition, Muslims and Buddhists and any number of other traditions. It was a real fruit salad gathering here of religion. And it became very evident the first day of this three-day conference when we were there that there was no tolerance for the idea that Jesus is the one and only way to God. And in the opening speeches that were given for the conference, this was made very clear. So clear was it made that when they called us to the central banquet table in the large room where we began the conference, I turned to the missionary with whom I was traveling and I said, we really can't eat at this table. This is the table of demons. So insulting was the outlook, although it was quite politically correct and it would fit right in here in America as well as there in Moscow, but it was not at all something that a Christian, a child of God, could be pleased to do. And as we left that evening, our cameraman, who was not at all compromising in this matter, but he suggested that maybe it wouldn't be worthwhile to come back in two days when I was to be speaking. 
And he said, they really aren't going to want to hear what we have to say here. And I told him that I realized that, but that I very much wanted to come back because I wanted Jesus Christ, who is enthroned in heaven, to be glorified by what we had to say. That the audience may not welcome it, but Jesus deserves this praise. So we went back, and I know my translator, who was a university student, a good Christian young man, real pleasure to get to know Gennady. But of all the times I was speaking, I could tell his knees were probably quaking the most as we went to this conference where a woman from the Supreme Soviet was going to be leading the conference that day, and we had this full auditorium and all these other religions, and he knew what I was going to be saying. And I tried to explain to them that religious liberty in Russia could not be secured through a combination of relativism and secularism, which is what we had been hearing. Relativism that says no one can say absolutely I'm right and you're wrong. It's like no one knows for sure. There's this great mysterious universe out there and everybody's making their best shot at understanding it. But no religious tradition, Christian or non-Christian or any tradition with, you know, within the Christian community, has the right to say this is what is true in any absolute way. And then secularism in their view of civil government, which said that the civil government can't make any religious commitments. The secular or the civil government must be secular if there's going to be religious liberty. It's like if the government keeps its hands off religion and keeps out of religion, then maybe we'll break with the communist tradition and everybody will have the right to worship as they see fit. So Dr. Bonson tried to suggest to them that as a matter of fact, that was the best way to destroy religious liberty in Russia. That relativism and secularism actually provide a philosophical foundation for persecution. Stop and think about it. If Adolf Hitler decides he wants to rid the world of the scourge of the Jews, and he wants to persecute these people and their religion and commit genocide, when someone's a relativist, he has nothing to appeal to against that. There's no absolute standard by which you can say you're wrong to do this. There's no law above the law by which Hitler could be stopped from persecuting the Jews or any other religion for that matter. Take your own illustration. So I said, you, you mustn't fall into relativism or the view that the government is not bound by some kind of religious authority. And then I tried to explain that only Jesus Christ is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, can be that absolute authority that will provide religious liberty of the appropriate kind. Well, as I was getting close to the end of my remarks, though the woman from the Supreme Soviet, you know, wouldn't know where I was, after I mentioned some of the persecution that took place in Russia, along with the illustrations of religious persecution in our own country and around the world, and how every major religion is guilty of that, when I mentioned the Russian situation, that was finally enough. And I could hear this, you know, stuff going on at the table where all the leaders of the conference were apparently discussing. So she finally called out, Dr. Bonson, your time is up. I figured I hadn't come to Russia to be, you know, silenced by some feminist communist woman here. So I continued to speak. But I could tell Gennady, who, I mean, I didn't know Russian, but he knew what she had said. And he was hoping that I would get done real quick. Well, we got done with that. And we went to sit down, and again, the cameraman turned, and he said, what do you think, should we leave now? <laughs> I said, well, I don't want to be impolite. Let's wait till they get to their morning coffee break, and then perhaps we can leave. Well, so happens, the last speaker right before the coffee break that morning was a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church. When this fellow came up, of course, in his clerical garb, the Russian Orthodox Church was quite different from anything we would expect anyway. He had the most dour expression, you know, long face and so forth, very serious. So I'm listening, you know, to the provided translation. And as he begins, he says that he doesn't share the optimism and the, it wasn't goodwill, but it was a word similar to that, of all the participants here in this conference. And he had been listening to what I had to say. I had suggested, you know, to them that they didn't really want religious liberty for Branch Davidians and Satanists and those who had you know, kill children and satanic sacrifice and things of that nature. Well, he, he reuses these illustrations, and he said, if what we're talking about is changing Russia, 
to be open to all these kinds of ungodly things. And he says, then I won't sign any statement that comes out of this conference. And then he starts quoting the Bible to these people. And this is not really your Russian Orthodox approach to things, but he reminds us that Paul says, what fellowship does light have with darkness and so forth? But he really let them have it. I was really glad that we had stayed. And when he finished, we were down on the front row, he came down to meet us. You know, he wanted to, he wanted to get to know Dr. Bonson. He said to me through the translator, he says, we're not accustomed to Protestants from America speaking in the way that you did. And he was very happy we were there. I'm really glad we decided to go back. But you see, the outlook of all of these world leaders in religion, which many people would fawn over and bow down to and show all this respect for, is foolishness. It accomplishes the very opposite of what they wanted. Jesus tells us in Matthew 7 that when people will not follow his word, they're doing things that are really stupid. So evidently stupid, it would be like a man trying to come down to the beach there in Southern California and build a mansion right there next to the ocean. Later in Russia, when I met with the head of one of the largest capitalist educational institutions there, one of the nicest buildings in all of Russia we had seen. In fact, when I got there to have my meeting with this man, we were kind of put off for about a half hour, served tea and everything. The secretary was embarrassed that he wasn't there. He was meeting with Kozbulatov, who, as you know, was the man who finally was imprisoned by Yeltsin for trying to foment a revolution against presidential power there. Well, this is a very important man in Russia. And again, I don't know, apart from the grace of God, how I had appointments made for me with people like this. I really don't look upon myself as hobnobbing with such people. But he came in and he gave us very graciously um, what well, was going to be a half hour, but it extended beyond that, of an audience. So we could suggest that their organization needed Christian education, if there was going to be any success in Russia and reforming their society and redoing their economic order and so forth. And I used an illustration, which you'll know that I was plagiarizing. I told him that many times people in Russia look upon the West, and particularly the United States, and they see the economic prosperity and all the goods and services and things that we enjoy, and they think they can transfer that prosperity to Russia without worrying about the foundation upon which it was built historically in the United States of America. And I said, it would be like a man who is out here on the Mesa, and he sees this wonderful mansion that has been built on this huge boulder, this huge rock, has this great foundation. And he looks at the outward style of the mansion, and he really said, that would be great. He loves this. He wants to do it. So he buys all the building material, and down at the ocean now, he starts building. He thinks he can build the same house, the same mansion, right there on the sand. I, the man then, you see, smiles, he sees the point. You know where it was taken from, of course. This is what Jesus said. Now, here's this man who doesn't really have great Christian training, doesn't even understand literature of the Bible that I'm using with him and so forth, but even he smiles knowingly when he thinks of a man who would spend his money trying to build a mansion or a house on the sand. It's just outwardly ridiculous. And yet that's what secular scholars are doing. And it's not just scholars, that's what your next door neighbor is doing. That's what your milkman is doing. That's what your relatives are doing who are unbelievers. When they try to object to the Christian faith, they are doing something so obviously stupid that Jesus says they're like building their house upon the sand. And great will be the collapse of that. If they don't learn better and get a better foundation for them. And so this morning when I exhorted you all to be defenders of the faith and told you you needed to be prepared to answer anyone who asked you a reason for the hope that is in you, and you began to wonder, well, how can you do that? The first thing you must do, and this is the first major point in the lesson tonight, is you must learn not to see autonomous thinking as somehow awesome, intellectually sharp, or wise. You must begin by understanding that any thinking which opposes the word of God is foolish. Not in the Mr. T way. That's not just God from heaven in a more polite way saying they're fools because they won't agree with me. The actual character of unbelieving thinking is foolish. And it's your job to expose that foolishness. 
the Bible tells us that the mental and the spiritual perspectives of believers and unbelievers differ radically from each other. I'll give you a fancy word for this, although if you don't remember the word, that'll be fine, but we often refer to this as the antithesis. This antithesis is a conflict of hostile perspectives. And the Bible shows us that the perspective of the believer and the unbeliever have that kind of antithesis to one another. They radically differ from each other. In principle, according to what the unbeliever will profess and what the believer will profess, in principle, their basic outlooks on life, on how we know what we know, what the nature of reality is, how we should live our lives, their basic outlooks are going to be in conflict with each other at every point. The all-pervading sinful depravity of the unregenerate man touches his intellect as much as anything else. That's why we as Calvinists speak of total depravity. The depravity of man is not, you see, restricted to just one aspect of his being or his living, but everything about man is depraved, according to the Bible, including his thinking. The mind of the sinful nature is at enmity with God, Paul says in Romans 8, 7, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor can it be. It's at enmity. This is not polite detente between those who think God's thoughts after him and those who attack them. But this is enmity. It's hostility. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, where God established what between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent? Enmity. Hostility. There's a war going on out there. And this warfare is between those that are described in the Bible as wise because they think God's thoughts after him and those who are fools. Paul's description of the unbelieving mind in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, is graphic. Turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 4 and look at verses 17 to 19. Let's see just how much reverence and awe the Apostle Paul had for the thinking of the unbeliever. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that you no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, being darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart. Boy, that's not a long list of flattering remarks, now is it? Paul says they walk in the vanity of mind, then he adds, darkened in their understanding. Then he puts this on top of that, alienated from the life of God. And why is that? Because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardening of their heart. Boom, boom, boom. He just keeps it up, doesn't he? He doesn't say, now I realize these people have a lot of accomplishments and so forth, and we have to respect them as far as they go. He just categorically denounces the thinking of the Gentile mind. And he says, you aren't to walk that way. You are not to emulate the mind of the unbeliever. The reason why so many people who do take it in hand to become apologists for the Christian faith are very unsuccessful at that work is because they try to emulate the thinking of the fool in order to change the fool's mind. The Apostle Paul says you need to recognize that there's this antithesis and that you are not to think as Gentiles think. In Romans 1 verse 22 Paul says of unbelievers, professing themselves to be wise, they made big mistakes in their conclusions, right? For those of you who have turned to read it or know it by heart, know that uh, <clears throat> that's the politically correct, maybe that's the more southern, genteel, polite way of putting it. But Paul wasn't concerned to be polite, he was concerned to be truthful and to make sure the people of God were not misled. And he says that those who profess themselves to be wise in all of their autonomy, being a self-sufficient law to themselves, and all of their rationalism, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. It's not surprising, therefore, that believers and unbelievers, having totally conflicting perspectives on the nature of reality, how we know what we know, and how we should live our lives, not surprising with those different perspectives that they don't share a common view of knowledge either. They don't share a common view of logic. They don't share a common view of historical evidence. They don't share a common view of language. They don't share a common view of truth. Think about this. 
Pilate arrogantly asked in the presence of the one who said he was the way, the truth, the life. He said, what is truth? Agrippa differed with Paul, and Paul said, why do you find this something unbelievable that God should raise the dead? In 1 Timothy 6.20, Paul says that what unbelievers call knowledge, believers shun as pseudo-knowledge, not even worthy of the name knowledge. Or look at 1 Corinthians 1 at the 18th verse. So you again might understand the antithesis and the way in which the Bible characterizes both schools of thought. For the word of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. For it stands written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning will I bring to nothing. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And so the world, with its approach to truth and evidence and logic and all the rest, <clears throat> comes to the conclusion that the word of the cross is foolish. But those who believe the word of the cross look upon the thinking of the world as what? Foolish. So who's truly wise? Who's foolish? Well, Paul puts out the challenge. See, Paul was the debater <clears throat> of that day and age. He said, where's the debater of this age? Bring him on. Who wants to debate these points? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? The second major point that I want you to pick up in tonight's lesson is that not only must you not regard the thinking, the standards, the perspective of the unbeliever is somehow academically, you know, shining armor. You should see it as foolishness. The Bible tells you that there's an antithesis between the way the believer thinks and the way the unbeliever thinks, and that you must not fall into the ways of thinking of the unbeliever. Now, when I say the ways of thinking, I do not simply mean the conclusions of the unbeliever. What I'm saying is the unbeliever doesn't have the right patterns of thought either. He doesn't have the right standards of thought. He doesn't have the right methods in thinking. The unbeliever is going to interpret everything that you present to him, every line of logical proof, every kind of historical evidence, everything you say to the unbeliever is going to be interpreted according to his presuppositions, his final authority, his ultimate standard. Now, he doesn't think that's foolish. He thinks that's very wise. The Bible says, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools. But nevertheless, the unbeliever is going to reinterpret everything you say according to his way of seeing the world. And by the way, everything that he says to you, you're going to be interpreting according to your ultimate presuppositions, too. A good example of this. Let's, um, let's assume that we're going to argue for the truth of Christianity by presenting evidence for the resurrection of Christ. Now, if you're a believer, that ought to be pretty impressive to you. God raises the dead. That says a lot to you about the nature of God. It tells you something about the character of his son, Jesus Christ, and the veracity of his word. No doubt about that. God presents evidence of all sorts to us to reassure us of his veracity. But now if I present the evidence that the um, body of Jesus resuscitated to an unbeliever who is being intelligent, self-conscious about his ways of thinking, he has no reason to reject what I'm telling him at all. Over and over again, I talk to people who use what's called the traditional or evidential approach to apologetics, and I invite them to use that apologetic on me as kind of a test case. I said, let me play the devil's advocate here for a few minutes. I want you to run your apologetic, you know, at me. And I'm not saying this with any sense of, you know, personal pride at all, but I'll tell you, over the years I've done this many times, and I won't mention the names, many published authors who have done the same thing, and not one has lasted four minutes. Not one, because they usually start in by laying out all the evidence for the reliability of the New Testament, and Jesus makes these claims. I usually say, hurry up, that's fine, I have no objection, no objection. They say, well, I thought you were going to play the devil's advocate. I say, that's fine. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. They begin to wonder what's going on here. And they say, well, according to this evidence, the most likely explanation for why the church arose and the Apostle Paul, you know, was converted and on and on is that Jesus really was alive after his death. I say, that's fine. I agree. 
So now wait a minute. If you agree that Jesus rose from the dead, then you need to become a Christian. I say, oh no, not at all. Strange things happen in this world. Let that sink in for a minute. Dr. Van Til used to put it this way. You may not understand the illusion, but he said, when the Christian presents all the evidences for the resurrection, the unbeliever has every right to say, send it to Ripley's Believe It or Not. This is a, this is a strange world in which we live. And the day is coming, by the way, I actually know professors of physics that have said this sort of thing, the day is coming when we'll understand what the natural process is by which sometimes cadavers come back to life. Very unusual. People will say it's not, it's not surprising that a primitive people, notice the arrogance, you know, our culture versus theirs, but not surprising that primitive people, you know, experiencing something that was very unusual statistically like this, would think, well, there must be a supernatural cause for this. Of course, we know that there's a natural cause. We haven't studied it. We don't have enough cases before us that we can figure it out just yet, but someday we'll know what it is. Now, what's going on here? The self-conscious unbeliever is reinterpreting the evidence for Christianity according to his naturalistic presuppositions. So for him, there's no problem with the resurrection of Jesus. It's a problem that we haven't figured it out yet, but on the other hand, we haven't figured out the cause of AIDS either. No one should make a big supernatural point out of that. Of course, maybe we want to make a supernatural point out of that in terms of the judgment of God, but what we're getting at is I think everybody, even those who believe it's the judgment of God, do believe there's some natural mechanism by which the AIDS virus works. And so when unbelievers say we haven't figured it out yet, you shouldn't think somehow you've won the argument. The unbelievers, there's a lot of things we haven't figured out. Give us time. And so when we give the evidence of the resurrection, if we don't challenge the underlying foolish presuppositions of the unbeliever, the unbeliever has every right to accept what we say and totally, you know, be unfazed by it. Like, in a chance universe, all sorts of things can happen. It's just um, like catching a baseball that's thrown at you and then tossing it behind you into a bottomless pit. You know, you're never going to fill up that pit, no matter how many baseballs, no matter how many facts, no matter how many evidences you throw at this person, he's just going to keep tossing it back him, because that's the kind of universe the unbeliever thinks this is. And so you have to understand that if we don't deal with presuppositions and the ultimate authority that is used by the unbeliever, if we don't debate our final authority, our presuppositions, we're never going to become effective in defending the faith. Well, we got a problem now we have to resolve before time runs out. Dr. Bonson, look what you've just taught us. This morning you said that we can't be neutral. That we have to reason subject to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Even in apologetics, that's what Paul says. Setting Christ apart as Lord in your hearts, be ready to give an answer to anybody who asks you. So we can't be neutral. We can't appeal to some kind of common notion of reason to defend the faith. And now tonight you're teaching us this fancy word antithesis. And you say that we have these ultimate worldviews or philosophies of life that are at war with each other. And everything you present to the unbeliever, he's going to reinterpret according to his worldview. And everything he says, we reinterpret. How are we ever going to get across the message? How is anything ever going to touch our opponent? How can we debate anything in any meaningful way? And since we're learning fancy vocabulary tonight, I'll be bold and teach you one more expression here because it will help summarize what I want you to take home. Differing presuppositions can be discussed, can be compared. People holding these different worldviews can argue with each other about what we call in philosophy the preconditions of intelligibility. Wow, that sounds neat, huh? You want to write that down. Preconditions of intelligibility. Very simply put, preconditions of intelligibility, the question about the preconditions of intelligibility is what would have to be true in order for it to be meaningful, say, to use logic? What would have to be true about the world in order for there to be moral absolutes? What would have to be true about the world in order for scientific inferences to be drawn? When the unbeliever wants to appeal to science, wants to appeal to logic, wants to appeal to ethics, whatever it may be, to argue against the Christian faith, 
eventually we're going to have to compare the worldview, the presuppositions of the unbeliever, to the worldview and presuppositions of the Christian, and ask which of these provides the preconditions of intelligibility. It's not simply an issue about whether Jesus rose from the dead. That's going to be variously interpreted. By the way, not every unbeliever would say Jesus rose from the dead. Given some presuppositions, they would resist that with all their might. The point is, different philosophies of life can respond to that evidence in different ways. Not all of it leads to Christian commitment. And so when I compare my presuppositions to the presuppositions of the unbeliever, the question is going to be, well, how do you choose? Is it just a matter of style, just a matter of how we choose hats? You're like, well, I, can, I like fancy myself a Christian. I think I'll take those presuppositions. Somebody says, no, no, I think of myself as a free thinker. I won't be a Christian. Is it just a matter of taste? Is it just a matter of style? No, it's not. It's according to the teaching of the Bible, which you've seen illustrated in any number of ways tonight, although you didn't know this was coming. According to the teaching of the Bible, those who profess presuppositions or an outlook on life, which is contrary to the Christian faith, become fools. That is, they cannot make sense out of what they are talking about. They cannot make intelligible their use of science, their use of ethics, their use of logic. Recently, when I had this debate with the ACLU lawyer at the University of California in Davis, one of the things that this man who was Jewish and had relatives that had been killed by Hitler at Auschwitz want to bring up against the Christian faith and against all theism, as a matter of fact, was that this tragedy, this ethical tragedy had taken place. And so he would say, how can there be a God that would allow that sort of thing to happen? Implicitly, you see, this is a moral charge against God. It's like there can't be a God because if there were a God that allowed that to happen, he would be immoral or it would be immoral. All right. I responded to Mr. Tavish that although I personally feel it's tragic that his relatives were treated in this way, that given his worldview, he can't make sense of any moral judgment about it one way or another. Given his atheistic worldview, what happens happens. That's all there is to it. There are no moral values to be imposed on the facts of history are compared to the facts of history, because there are no moral values. The only moral values available to an atheist are those which are freely chosen by the individual. Now, he would say that much. He would say we all have to choose our moral values, and he thinks that his, and as far as I know, he wants to be a good citizen, wants to be a good neighbor, those sorts of things. He has, you know, a worldview that, for him, he wants those kind of kindly values where we don't kill one another and take advantage of each other and all that. But the important point here, and I want you to catch this, is that when your next door neighbor, when your milkman or the man that I'm debating at the university tells us that moral values are chosen, even if he chooses good moral values, as far as you can see as a Christian, the fact is they are not moral absolutes. They are personal preferences. And if that's the nature of morality, then Hitler had every right to have his own moral preferences. And so Hitler, you see, chose to get rid of the Jews, and he had just as much, quote-unquote, right to do that as we have the right to say we disagree with it. And so here's a man who's trying to formulate a moral argument against God, against Christianity, but he cannot give the preconditions of intelligibility for his argument. Because his argument assumes something about the nature of reality, which is not true given his atheism. Professing himself to be wise, he has become a fool. Romans 121 says that unbelievers become vain in their reasoning, and their senseless hearts are darkened. In 2 Timothy 2.25, Paul tells us that by means of their foolish perspective, they actually end up opposing themselves. When a man wants to complain about the genocide of the Jews and how his family has suffered from it, he's just opposing his own ends. He's opposing himself when he says there can be no God. 
or 1 Timothy 6.20, again, Paul tells us that the conception of knowledge, which is held by the unbeliever, doesn't deserve the name knowledge. In Colossians 2, verses 3 and 8, which we already studied this morning, Paul said that the presuppositions of worldly philosophy rob us of knowledge so that unbelievers are left in ignorance. To put it very simply, in 1 Corinthians 1.20, this is the theme of Paul's apologetic. It's the challenge we've already heard tonight. Where's the wise? Where's the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Your job, at whatever level of sophistication, no one expects you, certainly the Lord doesn't expect you to talk about it in the same way that a PhD in philosophy might talk. That might be to your credit not to talk that way. Whatever level of your social encounter, what you need to share with the person that is disputing the Christian faith is something that exposes the foolishness of their worldview. They're actually opposing themselves. They're not able to make sense of their own arguments. Given what they believe, they couldn't argue at all. In various forms, the fundamental argument, in various forms, please catch that. You know, we don't have this kind of you know, factory-produced line of defending the faith. So now we go out, we can put this in a brochure, and that's what we give to everybody. You learn to talk to people, to hear what they believe about the nature of the world and how they think they know what they know and how they think they should live their lives. And when they argue against the faith, you have to show them that their own worldview contains these internal contradictions. They cannot say, let's say you have a next door neighbor and you ask him, well, maybe you don't want to ask the kind of question. You may sound too intellectual, but you say, what's your philosophy of life? And he says, I haven't got a philosophy of life. As far as I'm concerned, you'll look around once in life, grab for all the gusto you can get. Yeah, but that's a philosophy of life too. It may not be sophisticated. It may not, may not be expressed in an academic form, but that's a philosophy of life. One, you only go around once in life. There's nothing beyond this life. Okay, so he's a materialist. And how do you live your life? Only going around once. Well, he's a hedonist, too. He says, grab for all the gusto you can get. And by the way, he's a particular form of hedonist. In philosophy, we distinguish between qualitative hedonism and quantitative hedonism. You know, Aristippus versus Epicurus. So although he didn't think that he had a philosophy of life, he actually is following Aristippus, the ancient philosopher who said, get all the pleasure you possibly can. All right, so this same neighbor who has told you this one Saturday afternoon as you were talking, as you're both mowing your lawns and so forth, later tells you when you invite him to come to church with you, oh, no, I couldn't possibly go to church. I don't believe in God. You say, well, yeah, that makes sense because you only think we go around once in life and you should just live for all the pleasure you can possibly get. This neighbor goes on to tell you that he's just fed up with the police brutality, I say out in Los Angeles, which is a big topic, as you know. Or to give you another example, I always remember this. When I was a university student, a college student, I'd go to the local city college to evangelize. And this is the days of the sexual revolution and uh, counterculture and on and on. And I'd run into people all the time who were living with their boyfriend or their girlfriend out of wedlock. So we talk about that sort of thing. And I try to you know, present what the Bible says about that and our guilt before God and how that has to be dealt with. And many times that I have these people tell me that when it comes to you know, morality, it's different strokes for different folks. So I had no right to bring my fundamentalist, old-fashioned, superstitious religious point of view and condemn you know, their lifestyle. And at the very same time, these people who are living as sexual relativists would tell me that what the United States government was doing in Vietnam was absolutely abhorrent. But you see how, here's a person trying to build a mansion on sand. You say, it's different strokes for different folks, and then they turn right around and condemn the government for being immoral. And, of course, you can imagine what I would say back. I'd say, hey, if it's different strokes for different folks, what Richard Nixon does is just to his pleasure. He's only going around once in life, too. He's grabbing for all the gusto he can get. So you've got to turn the philosophy of the unbeliever against the unbeliever and show him what? Okay, Whether it's with my vocabulary or your vocabulary, whatever the issue may be, the whole point is to show the foolishness of his thinking.
that it destroys itself. Where's the wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of this world? Basic proof of the Christian worldview is that without it, you couldn't prove anything. You may want to write that down if you're taking notes. Reflect on that. Study that. Think about ways in which you can show that as you're conversing with people. The basic proof is that ultimately, if you use your standards, your ultimate authority, if you look at the world the way you tell us to look at the world, you say to the end believer, we couldn't make sense of anything, even your argument against Christianity. The basic proof of Christianity is that without it, you couldn't prove anything. Now, tomorrow, when I lecture again, Lord willing, I'm going to offer you the toothpaste proof of God's existence. I'm going to let you think about that tonight, what that could possibly mean. I guarantee you it has nothing to do with, you know, having shinier teeth and, you know, proving people to people that, you know, Christianity is right in that way. We can't go over all the different ways in which this can be illustrated, but I want you to know this is the little kernel you got to take away that the proof of the Christian worldview is the preconditions of intelligibility cannot be provided otherwise. And when people try to do science, when they try to do logic, when they try to do ethics or anything, ballet to baseball, they can't make sense of what they're doing if they don't put it in a Christian framework of thought, that only the Christian worldview can make sense of what they are doing and what they are thinking. I'm going to close by having us look at Romans 1 very briefly. Please turn with me to Romans, the first chapter. The reason I'm doing this is because if you've been paying attention, you know, if you're one of my better students, you're running out ahead of the professor and you're saying, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. If what you're saying is true, that the unbelieving worldview can't make sense out of anything, then unbelievers couldn't know anything at all, could they? So let me surprise you by agreeing. That's right. If unbelievers actually thought in terms of what they profess to be true about the world, if they actually thought of there being no God, and they lived their lives in that way, they couldn't know anything. They would be blithering idiots. That's a strong claim. I mean, the Bible backs it up. You want to know, though, well, then why aren't unbelievers blithering idiots? Romans 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Who suppress the truth by means of unrighteousness. Because that which is known of God is manifest in them, for God manifested it unto them. Paul says that unbelievers know the truth of God. They believe the truth of God, and then they suppress it. They don't want to admit it. They don't want that to come to the surface and be apparent. They'll say they don't believe in God, but they know it in their heart of hearts. And they distort it and misuse it and live unrighteously. But the fact of the matter is they know this truth. And how is Paul so sure of it? He says, because God made it manifest to them. And unlike our telephone companies in the 20th century, when God sends through a message, it always reaches its destination. He never gets a busy signal. God has manifested the truth about himself, and he knows that everyone knows him. So much is this the case that Paul says, the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. You may enjoy the literary play on words there. Paul says invisible things are seen and clearly seen. How clearly seen are they? How sure is the unbeliever? How confident can he be about the attributes of God? If you go to the end of that verse, Paul says that they may be without excuse. Without excuse. Of course, the unbeliever thinks he has all kinds of excuses. You hear unbelievers, they'll tell you, I'm ready to believe in God. It's not that I'm hostile against God. Yeah, right. That is what the Bible says. But they play innocent. You know, I'd be willing to believe it's just that. There isn't enough evidence, you know, or it's ambiguous. People who pretend to be agnostics, you know, will say, well, I don't want to say that there isn't a God, but there isn't enough evidence to say that there is a God. 
know, there isn't anybody who's truly an agnostic any more than there's anybody who's truly an atheist. But if people were to be consistent with their agnosticism, wouldn't you expect them to go to church twice a month? All right? If they were really agnostic, they'd say, well, you know, the evidence pro and con kind of balances out. You can't be sure. So you would think that on one Sunday, they would live like atheists, and another Sunday, they'd live like Christians. And so twice a month, they'd be in church because they're really agnostic. Well, they're not agnostic. But when they say, I just can't be sure about the evidence, Paul says, yes, you can be sure, and so clear is the evidence that God has given that they are without excuse. I love what the Greek gives us here. The Greek actually says they are without an apologetic. The very thing I'm trying to teach you, what you have a defense of the faith, they haven't got any defense without any excuse. Verse 21, because knowing God, they glorified him not as God. How does Paul describe the unbeliever? Does this surprise you? Paul says they know God. And he doesn't say they know a God. He doesn't say they have some idea of a force out there somewhere. They know the God in Greek, the living and true God, the one and only God. They know this God because knowing God, they refuse to glorify him or give thanks, and then what happens? When knowing God, they will not respond in obedience to God. They become vain in their reasoning, and their senseless heart was dark. And professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, which is what we've been talking about tonight. And so I've taught you that in principle, the unbeliever couldn't know anything. In principle, the unbeliever couldn't make sense of ethics, could not make sense of science, could not make sense of logic. In principle, the unbeliever cannot make intelligible what he or she is appealing to against the Christian faith. And so then you think, well, then, of course, they're blithering idiots. They don't know anything. Well, as a matter of fact, they are able to know things. They know many things. The doctors who did open heart surgery and Dr. Bonson were unbelievers. They knew a whole lot more about that than I did or my pastor. And I preferred them to do the open heart surgery than those who didn't. So they know a lot of things. However, they can't make sense of what they know. They cannot justify what they know. Given their worldview, it would be impossible to know what they in fact know. So what the Bible says is you're dealing with somebody who's schizophrenic. You're dealing with somebody who really lives in two different worlds. The one is never admitted. That's God's world. The unbeliever understands God knows God very intimately, knows him so well that the unbeliever is without excuse for not glorifying God and living in an obedient way. The unbeliever knows God in his heart of hearts, but will not admit it, suppresses the truth by means of unrighteousness. But because the unbeliever knows God, the unbeliever can make some sense of God's world, live in God's world, and have some degree of success there. So we're not claiming that unbelievers are blithering idiots. We're saying that they would be if what they profess philosophically, what they said about reality and how we know what we know, if they really did believe those things, they would be reduced to absurdity and they'd have nowhere to go but to be absurd. So when we get together tomorrow, we're going to continue this thought. I'm going to try to show you how you can put some feet on this method of defending the faith give some practical illustration, in particular, as I say, the toothpaste proof of God's existence. Please, when you defend the faith and you show the foolishness of unbelief, do not become a fool with the unbeliever. Do not go over to his point of view, to his way of thinking, thinking that that's the only way you can draw him you know, to the Christian faith. Proverbs 26, verses 4 and 5, the author of Proverbs says, don't answer a fool according to his folly. Don't answer the foolish outlook of the unbeliever according to his own foolish outlook. Don't try to use his standards to convince him that he's wrong. And why not? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like unto him. All of those schools of apologetics that teach us we are to ignore the antithesis, we're to share the presuppositions of the unbeliever and try to bring them over to the Christian point of view, are just encouraging people to become as foolish as the unbeliever is himself. When I got on a plane 
last week to leave Orange County coming to Atlanta. I realized that at some point after I got on that plane and they closed the door, we were all in this ride together. We were all going to end up in the same place together. You mustn't think that if you get on the unbeliever's airplane, you get on his way of thinking, his method of doing things using his standards, that you're going to be able to get off at some point and not end up where he ends up in foolishness. You mustn't share the outlook of the unbeliever to try to convince him that he's wrong because everyone on that plane is going to end up at the same destination. And ultimately, that destination is damnation. All right, I'm going to give you an opportunity to ask some questions here before we go home. Maybe you want to let this sink in and think for a moment. There was a question asked this morning that I promised I would take up this evening, and I'll do that one first while you're thinking of the next thing you can ask. The question had to do with the apologetic of Gordon Clark, and I ended up saying a little bit about Clark's view of logic and his translation of John 1.1 1, 1 and, and why I, I feel that that's not helpful and actually misleads people. He says, in the beginning was the logic, and that is not what John is trying to tell us, although it is true that God is logical and that God's people ought not to violate, you know, uh, logical consistency. But the point is, we do that out of moral submission to the character of God, not because we think the character of God matches up to some impersonal standard that is above God called logic. All right. In Dr. Clark's apologetic, you really have two phases in his career. Early on, Dr. Clark said that the Christian worldview should be affirmed because it is the most logical of all the worldviews that are out there. There's a sense in which that's true. Some of what you're going to hear me say tomorrow might sound like that, because we do criticize worldviews that are illogical. But I think it is a grave mistake to suggest that what we are doing is comparing different hypotheses. You have the Hindu hypotheses, and you have the atheist hypotheses, and you have the Christian hypothesis, and then we have this neutral standard of logic that we apply to them to find out which is the most coherent. I said that was the early Gordon Clark. I find that rather rationalistic. But Dr. Clark changed toward the end of his life, and much of what he published at the end is actually a form of fideism. And he can't, by the way, he took that, many people use that as a term of disrespect and, you know, throw it at presuppositionals. But Gordon Clark accepted that term. He said, yes, I am a fideist. All of us just begin with a faith commitment. And then what he went on to do, following the kind of rationalistic strain that we've already seen this morning and then this evening, he went on to say, and there's nothing anybody can know outside of the Bible. He applied his rationalism so severely that he said, we don't learn anything from our observations. We don't learn anything from sensation at all. And there are many philosophical criticisms that can be made of the theory that says we know things by way of observation. And Dr. Clark was great at developing those anti-empirical polemics, all right? The idea that observation is the basis for what we know. However, the way in which he applied this is to turn into what I would consider a radical skeptic. Says you really can't know anything about the world. You can't know anything from observation or experience. And therefore, the only thing you can know is what God says in the Bible. And so anybody who disagrees with the Bible, basically, he wants to reduce them to skepticism. But also, as Christians, we need to be skeptical about anything except which is in the Bible. And I've already told you, and I have to keep saying this, because whenever we get into these intramural debates in the Christian community, people want to turn it into war. And I'm not trying to wage war here, but I am trying to be faithful to my Savior. And uh, when I say this about Dr. Clark, I say it with reverence and respect, but I believe that he's wrong. We do know things in addition to the Bible. I know that I'm Greg Bonson. I know who my mother and father are. I know that there's a hand in front of my face right now. There's a number of things we know in addition to the Bible. Now, Dr. Clark would say, no, no, you see, you, it's always possible that you have a perceptual error and on and on and on. But that's not the way the Bible tells us to look upon our experience and our observation. 
The Bible says that God put us in this world in order not only to understand it, but to have dominion in this world so that all things might be used to his glory. Once when I had lunch with Dr. Clark before he went to be of the Lord, and we were discussing his epistemology, I asked him how he could know he was saved. Now, why would I ask him that? Because according to his theory of knowledge, you can only know what's in this book. He said, yeah, and the way of salvation is found in this book, and I agree with that. But you know what's not found in this book is the name Gordon Clark. And so he might tell me with all assurance that the way of salvation is the following, but he could never tell me that Gordon Clark was saved. And so when he thought about that, I think his response, which was an attempt to swallow the absurdity and not realize he had to reconstruct his theory of knowledge, sadly, his response was, well, who of us can know what we're saved? I said, that's not what a Presbyterian minister says. Doesn't John tell us that we can know with full assurance that we are saved? That's why he gives us these things. We might know that we are saved. And so Dr. Clark's hypercritical, anti-empirical attitude, granted, is helpful for slicing and dicing the unbelieving worldviews that depend upon observation and are making an idol out of science and all that. That's fine. But that is not the Christian's theory of knowledge. As Christians, we can know things about the world. We can know, you know who we're married to, who our parents are in many cases. We can know that we are saved, even though those things are not mentioned in the Bible itself. And so very simply, I would say from beginning to end, in his translation of John 1.1, 1, 1, in his early phase of using the coherence test to prove the Christian worldview, and finally in his fideism based upon a radical anti-empirical skepticism, I can't agree with the theory of knowledge that Gordon Clark used. I think it is too hyper-rationalistic. Okay, now you have time. Unfortunately, yes. Those of you who are students at Christ College, we just finished a course where we talked about Duns Scotus, and you may remember, according to Duns Scotus, God is so radically free and sovereign that he's not bound by anything. There is no law to which he answers. That's why in medieval theology, you have a question of whether God could send the Virgin Mary to hell. Not that the theologians debating this thought that's what God was going to do. The question is, is God free to do that? Could God change his mind? Could God give an arbitrary law where the Virgin Mary would go to hell? And the school of Duns Scotus were the defenders of, yes, God is so sovereign he can do anything. And the great glory of covenant theology, many people do not understand the history of dogma well enough to see this. The great glory of the Reformation was not the doctrine of predestination. Duns Scotus was a predestinarian, but he was not covenantal. He did not believe that God bound himself to his own character and promise so that you can have that kind of arbitrariness. What we preach in the Reformed churches is that God has made a compact. He's made a covenant, and that is according to his own character, and he doesn't change. And when God lays down a law, to answer very briefly, the law is a reflection of his own unchanging nature. So it is not possible that God might have commanded us to kill our neighbor rather than to love our neighbor. He could not have reversed that because his own character doesn't change. Well, back here. And I can, yes, as a matter of fact. Okay. Sure. I'm going to use a form of argument that's called indirection. I'm going to prove this from the falsity of the opposite. If, in fact, we are all dreaming, or a, a stronger form of this is how can we be sure that God didn't create the world this morning and put us all in these places with like a memory bank, you know, installed in our heads. And so we all think we had this past life, but we didn't. How can we know that? Or how do we know that we're not dreaming? The two different forms of the same kind of skepticism. And I think the Christian's answer is, if that is the case, then what the Bible tells us is not true. Because the Bible tells us, of course, of a man who was born in Bethlehem and died on a cross and rose again, you know, in past history. It tells us of the creation of the world and the history of the Old Testament and on and on. I mean, I'm not going to belabor it. The Bible tells us that there is a real history of real people created by God and so forth. In which case, if we're all dreaming, or if the world was created 
today with these memory banks, then the Bible is not true. The Bible is not true, then God is not voracious. And if God is not voracious, we have no basis for knowing anything at all. Ergo, if this radical skepticism is to be accepted, then it's impossible to know anything, even the radical skepticism that is being used in this illustration. We can't even know that we're talking to each other. So from the impossibility of the contrary, we can show that what is being posed here by Gordon Clark is not correct. And that is a demonstrative argument of a transcendental form. Go ahead. But it may be that I didn't listen closely enough. I ask your forgiveness if that's true. If you want an empirical proof, if that's what Gordon Clark is asking for, I think people should simply say that's not the sort of thing that's proven empirically. By the way, even those who are not Christians would tell him as much. If all of us are at this point dreaming, forget you know, any appeal to sense, experience, observation, and so forth, as a conceptual matter, just a matter of analysis of the claim itself, if all of us are in fact dreaming, then there is no difference between dreaming and what we consider awakened states. And the minute you've said that, then it's just a verbal game. Because then what we do in dreaming is no different in practice from what we do in what we call being awake. So call it what you will. That's kind of like saying none of us don't, none of us know anything at all. So yeah, but we do distinguish between, you know, mistakes about who won the World Series and and, you know, what kinds of cure for malaria are available and so forth. We distinguish between truth and error and those things. So how can everything be false? Well, when people give a defense of their skepticism at that point, where they refuse to draw that distinction, the comeback is always in terms of conceptual analysis. Well, then there really is no difference between being false, even though this is, you know, true, this is what we would do, and being false and being false. We would not do that. So the internal analysis of the claim destroys the claim. So either, I mean, if, if, if Clark wanted an empirical proof, I think any intelligent philosopher, anybody trained in philosophy would say it's not the sort of thing we need to appeal to experience or to some kind of sensation in order to show that. Yes, sir. Well, you're asking me a very big question. One, the generalization that the Puritans borrowed heavily from the Greeks. I'm not sure that I would say it was heavy, but certainly there was Greek influence in their thinking. And then the, then the next question, which is equally big, is that instrumental in their downfall? I just don't know that I'm competent you know, to, to have that wide-ranging evaluation of what actually brought the downfall of the Puritans. Any number of things would contribute to that. And to the degree that any of us as Christians incorporate non-Christian thinking, that is going to be hurtful to our testimony, to our walk with God. There's no doubt about that. I just don't think I can say much helpful beyond what I've just said. Yes, sir. I should remind you all that in our tape ministry, we have courses that go into greater detail on many of these points. And because the hour is late, I have to resist the temptation to say everything I'd like about the comparison of old Princeton and the Warfieldian approach to apologetics and then presuppositionalism and Van Til and so forth. I'm just saying this is a big issue. Please don't take my thumbnail sketch as the final word on this. You can, you can explore it further in tapes that we have. Well, I'll tell you, B.B. Warfield is a real enigma because as a theologian, probably as good as any as we've had in the 20th century. I mean, very helpful, quite a Bible scholar, a wonderful, you know, testimony and help to us. But when Warfield got around to apologetics, you are right that he did appeal to, of course, he wouldn't call it unbelieving thought, but he would say unbelievers and believers together have the same common notions with respect to history, with respect to logic, human decency, and so forth. And according to Warfield, we need to show the credibility credibility of the Bible in its claims, in particular the historical credibility of its claims, 